morning, everybody. Um, a, a quick thank you to the a team at Columbia for giving, extending the opportunity to be here this morning to give you my perspective of climate and data from a, a, an insurance and reinsurance perspective. I selected the title around what's the target, um, and I have to say that I did not see Vanessa and Piers talk at the start, um, but there is a lot of intersection, and so we'll be having a good lunch together, I'm sure, as we talk about the need for climate. But what's the target? It's really around, if we think about all the targets that are being put in place around climate and disclosures, for, for me, with this topic, it's what's the target for climate data? What do we need to see happen? Where do we need to see the improvements to help us manage our business? So just quickly, a, a little bit about AXA and me. I think if I was in Europe, this would be a very different conversation. Uh, AXA is a very well-known brand overseas, but in America, perhaps not. So AXA is a global insurer uh, with um, providing insurance uh, in the, the life, um, life, health, uh, personal lines, and commercial lines insurance. Uh, we have over 145,000 employees. Uh, we have operations in 51 countries. And uh, we, have, we intersect with around 93 million clients. So we have a large global footprint. AXA XL, as Jeff mentioned, we are the commercial prop property casualty and specialty division of the AXA group. And so we offer insurance, commercial insurance, uh, to, from medium to large corporate clients with over a range of products and services uh, for their risk management needs. Uh, I'm head of climate at AXA XL. I'm not head of climate for the globe, so please don't hold me responsible for everything that's going on. Uh, and my role is really about uh, bringing together all the strategy and the work that we're doing around climate at AXA XL. I'm an actuary, right, and what is an actuary? Um, a little bit again to what uh, Pierre was saying. We look at data and we use data to assess uh, risk. Uh, we use information, historical information typically, to formulate how we think a particular pro product, a particular policy might perform. Why is an actuary head of climate as opposed to a meteorologist or a scientist or a sustainability professor professional? The reason we decided to put an actuary in this role was really, to, again, to bring that information, that uh, understanding around the business and this, uh, the science and the data into the way we're trying to embed climate into everything that we do. So that's the link to data for us today. All right, and as we think about climate, and as we think about climate and data from an insurance and reinsurance perspective, uh, we know that there is large amounts of data being collected every day. A quick Google search, and, and I have to say that I don't know whether it was with clean energy or not, but a quick Google search uh, reflected that we have, on average, we collect around 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. Another Google search to check what quintillion meant uh, <laughs> showed me that that's 18 zeros. So we collect a lot of data every day. And insurance and reinsurance is no different. Uh, we collect data uh, around the risks that we model, the claims that we pay. We use that data for our financial reporting. But when it comes to climate data, Although we're collecting these large volumes of data, I would have to say that the quality and the availability of this climate data for what we need is poor. It's improving, but it's poor. So in the context of insurance, where do we use climate data? And we use climate data in two areas. Uh, the physical risks, so the understanding of the extent to which the physical environment is changing. So we've heard about acute uh, weather phenomenon. And also on the transition side, we know that our um, the economy is transitioning. We know the business models of our clients are changing. And we need to have the data to understand what the commitments are that they're making, their emissions that they're uh, are producing, and how those are changing over time to allow us uh, to formulate a view on those clients and the direction that they're going in their transition. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the physical risk side of things. And, and in insurance, we use something called catastrophe models and pricing models to understand that risk. And catastrophe models are really uh, a function of three key components. And we've got hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. We define hazard as uh, the potential event, that an event that has the potential to cause damage. So for example, these could be acute or chronic uh, events, acute e events, a, a hailstorm, a, a tornado, or a, a tropical cyclone. 
um, and chronic events would be sea level rise and temperature rises. So understanding how those hazards work, uh, intersecting with the exposure, which is the, uh, what we define as the, uh, the acid ha that has the potential to be impacted by the hazard. The vulnerability is then the extent to which that particular acid has the ability to withstand that hazard. Right? So here we've got an example of a, a home where um, it's showing potential or, or investments that a particular house can make with regards to resilience or vulnerability improvements around wildfire, so defensible space area around the house, um, the materials that that home's been built of, all those type of things. The intersection of all those three key components, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, allow us to understand the risks that we take on and that we manage as an insurance company. And where climate data has improved over time to allow us to understand and increase uh, the, uh, our, our sort of understanding of the risk is really around understanding that hazard. So over time, um, we've just got that uh, picture over there. Those are the, the historic um, tropical cyclones that are impacting the US East Coast. Over time, those data sets have been able to be improved. And the way that we use that data is we, we use that data to formulate statistical distributions and allow us to do simulations around these particular events. And having the accuracy and the improvement of the volume of data allows us to be a little bit more comfortable and confident around those uh, distributions that we, um, we develop. Another area where data is improved is around allowing us to understand our exposure better. So, We've got there a satellite uh, picture of a particular um, city. The ability to really zero in on that exposure and understand the exact locations of these particular properties is really important. If you think a, a, a difference of around 50 meters um, for a home that's close to a river versus not, that can have a significant impact on the risk that we're exposed to. And then again, the use of satellite technology, drone technology, uh, allows us also to understand better the features that particular properties have when it comes to understanding the vulnerability. So we've seen an improvement in data over time has allowed us to increase our view and increase our understanding of these risks that we write today. But what about the future? We know that the climate is changing. And as Pierre mentioned, there's a lot of work that's been done around climate models globally. Um, climate models predictions uh, go years to decades out into the future. But as, we, as Pierre mentioned, the problem that we have with climate models is the resolution. Right? So as I mentioned there, when we look at and we understand the physical risk side of things, when we look at the, the risk that we take on as an insurer, we're looking at it at a particular pro property in a very, very specific location. The first picture up there on the left shows a global climate model with a 200 kilometer uh, square resolution. And you can probably just about make out that that's the US, right? Um, that has improved over time where we do have resolutions at, a, at, a, at a, a higher resolution. That bottom picture is around four square kilometers. But when we're looking at specific weather phenomenon at a particular exact location, even a four kilometer square grid doesn't really give us enough insight and information to allow us to understand the risk that we're exposed to. So improving that resolution, using those tools uh, that Pierre mentioned earlier, really will help us to understand the risk that we take on as the climate evolves. Another piece is around uh, data coverage and sampling biases. So the graph in the middle there, uh, that's showing the natural reported natural disasters from 1900 to current day from the our, our world in data. And if you were looking at that and you were making predictions around the impact of catastrophic events, you would think we would be on a very uh, um, painful uh, road ahead. But what this is actually showing is that there are sampling biases and data coverage issues in the data that we see. Right? So 1900, the population distribution wasn't the same. Uh, the number of reported events by the uh, by global population wasn't the same. So making sure that we've got the ability to go back in time, reevaluate the data, and ensure that the coverage of data that we have globally is important. Uh, the, the picture that I had before of those tropical cyclones uh, impacting the US, again, a lot of value at risk in the US, a lot of focus and attention um, around those, that particular data set. But as a global company with operations over the world, we need to be, have, be able to access that data and use that data for our needs on a global scale. 
Pierre mentioned also uh, uncertainty. We know with all models, when we have models, there are elements of uncertainty. We want to make sure we reduce those elements of uncertainty. So improving the science and the understanding of the science around the impacts of uh, a changing climate to those extreme events that we're exposed to allows us to eliminate that uncertainty, ensure that we're able to distinguish between natural variability and actual climate change signals when it comes to understanding the hazard. We've also got to think that risk is a function of those three, three parts of the equation, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. We spend a lot of time focusing on how the hazard's going to evolve. But what about the exposure? What about the vulnerability? How is society going to respond uh, to a changing climate? What does that mean for population dynamics, where people live, and the extent to which that risk that they're exposed to has changed? In order to, for us to reduce that uncertainty and understand the risk more, we need to have a full view around all three key components of the risk equation. Okay, so moving away from uh, physical risk uh, to transition risk. So we, we know that the global economy is transitioning. We know that our clients that we're supporting, their actions are changing, their business models are changing. Um, they're being required in some instances to disclose their emissions, disclose their transition plans. But as an insurer where we write risks uh, from medium to large corporates, that availability and access to that information is not, the coverage of that is not as broad as we need it to be. And so we need to be able to understand the path that our clients are taking, uh, the commitments that they're making as they transition uh, to net zero in order for us to set our climate targets and understand uh, the impact that we're having as an insurer. So improving that quality and availability of emissions data and transition plan information is critical for us as an insurer and reinsurer. So if I think about the question that I asked, what is the target for climate data? Under the physical risk side of things, it's making sure that we improve the coverage and the availability of data, both historic across all uh, uh, areas and as well uh, that geographic footprint as well improving the resolution to allow us to improve the forward-looking projections that we have and that we need. We need to consider all parts of the risk equation, not just the hazard. We need to think about how the exposure and the vulnerability is going to change. We need to improve the consensus around the science to try and help reduce that uncertainty, um, as well as thinking about that ability to be able to clearly distinguish between natural variability and climate signals. And then on the transition risk side, it's thinking about that consistency around information that we need and the coverage of the information that we need in order to understand the journey and the direction that our clients are taking. Thank you.